Good morning, good afternoon, hello to everyone. I'm excited about another live stream. Today we're going to take a look at a baptism. Uh, this is going to be a smaller event. Uh, before I get into any technical educational stuff, I always like to give it a minute, let people enter. Um, how's everyone doing? Let me know in the comments, in the chat, I should say. I'm going to give you guys a link to the work. Also, if you are new to the channel and you're checking it out for the first time, I'm going to give you guys a link to my work. Here's my work. Uh, I would love to build a community around these live streams, so if you guys want to share your work, go for it. I have a few ideas in the works. Uh, I know that I'm getting a lot of positive feedback from uh, these live videos of me sharing my work. I think they are a great way to teach, but I also would like to open it up to thinking a little bit more outside the box. I'd like to do one on creativity, where creativity comes from, how we can cultivate it. Is creativity something we can control or is it out of our hands? Are there habits we can develop in order to improve our creativity or put us in the zone? Uh, I'm thinking about collaborating with my friend, Dr. Ali Matu. Um, I haven't talked to him about it yet, but he's usually down to collaborate. If you haven't checked out the video I did with him, I really, really, really strongly recommend it. It's one of those videos that kind of gets lost um, it kind of gets lost in the algorithm. It got picked up by a photography blog or two and it got a little bit of a bump, but unfortunately it's not a gear review video. It's about freelancing and mental health and we did one on his channel as well. So I want to share that. Um, I re really recommend you guys check that out. Um, do me a favor if you're watching, could you guys just let me know that you can hear me okay? Uh, I think so. I tested it out. It looks like you can hear me okay. All right, and now I'm going to give you guys a link. I'm going to go through my web uh, Smug Mug, which is what I use to store all my photos and share them with clients. I'm going to go and find the page with all of these photos, the gallery, and I'm going to share that with you guys as well. So if you want to follow along or if you want to take a look at your own pace, You'll be able to do so. So here you guys go. If you guys have any questions preemptively before we begin, you know, put them down. I'll I'll make sure I always answer all questions as before. You guys do not have to feel limited here. You can ask me anything you want about photography. It doesn't have to be about the job we're looking at right now. It can be about anything. Hi Linda. All right, I'm glad you hear me. Interesting. There should have been a slideshow playing and it keeps stopping. Let's take another look here. I'm still figuring out all the streaming software. It's not, a lot of it is having complications. It's, a lot of it isn't working how it should, unfortunately. Like on my screen I'm testing, like it looks like we're stuck on one photo in Lightroom. Let me know if you're seeing that as well. There is a delay too. Okay, let's not do light uh, a slideshow, let's do something different. So how's everyone doing today? And does anyone want to share their work? Also, um, in addition to doing videos about creativity, etc., and different topics, I'm hoping those can be more of a discussion. But what I will do is I want to have guests on the uh, live stream. So other photographers, psychologists, creatives that I can talk to. Um, I want to do that. I'd also like to do critiques for you guys. I'm going to open it up first to the, my Patreon supporters 
it's only right. I appreciate all of you guys. I, Linda, I, I appreciate you. You were the very first one. Um, and I think I have five now. Not bad. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm doing this, I, I'm content with this not being a huge thing. I really am. Um, if I'm helping, like, if I know I'm helping five or ten people, I'm really happy. And so far, the feedback I'm getting from these live streams has been positive. I've actually lost subscribers from them, but the people that like them really like them. And I realized the casual people, the people that found my channel, maybe because like a website posted my video and then they saw the kind of content I really was making more educational, they kind of bounced. And I'm okay with that. I'm, again, I'm happy as long as I'm helping people. A few people, it's fine. All right. Let's see. I'm going to get started in one minute. Start looking through the work. Let's scroll through it for a bit. And then we'll start from the top and we'll talk about what kind of a job we're looking at and what were the challenges and the decisions I decided to make behind the work. Okay, let's go ahead. I'm going to filter these down a bit. Basically, I'm going to share. If it has at least two stars, I'm going to share it with you. Not because you guys know I like to share the entire job. I want you guys to see what an entire job looks like, What, especially if you're starting out, so you have some sort of an expectation for what full coverage looks like. But you guys can check out the link in the chat above where it's not the first link that's to my website which I would love for you guys to check out and the second one will give you is a link directly to this job you guys can take a look at everything so I'm gonna attempt a slideshow again and we'll find out if it has any problems and then we'll begin Okay, slideshow's not working. Let's find out if I'm running into technical difficulty. Give me one moment, guys. All right, it's not working, so we're going to go manually. It's kind of harder when I have to click around because I have to monitor the chat. I have to talk. I have to also scroll. Okay, so let's get started. Today's job we're looking at, again, is a baptism. Uh, it was in a dimly lit church, and when I arrived, I had to make a decision. Do I want to shoot with available light, or do I want to shoot with the flash? I always ask for what the rules are when you get to a job like this. You should always say, are there any restrictions on flash? Are there any issues? Will the priest have an issue, etc.? Most cases, they do not nowadays. But some churches, synagogues, etc., will have rules that you do need to follow um, while you're shooting in the... Hang on. I... Okay, it is working. Yeah, they will have rules you need to follow while shooting. Um, sometimes you'll have to actually be all the way in the back, like you're not going to be allowed to pass a certain row. This was a small event. There weren't a lot of people. People at the service were mostly just family. I don't think it was like an open service. And so pretty much I had free range. They said I can do anything I want. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean I walk around like a charging rhino. I'm still very delicate in how I maneuver. I'm very cautious. I'm not getting in people's way. I try to go as unnoticed as possible as a principal. Even though they accept that I'm there and they even prioritize my photography, uh, I can I can fulfill that priority and still be very 
in the background. I do not have to be very noticed. Like that's not, those two things can coexist. And so at the job, I'm basically staying unnoticed as much as possible. Here and there, people are connecting with me. They're noticing me and I'm grabbing those shots too. So like I said, I decided to shoot available light. And what that meant was I did have to do quite a bit of color correction. And you guys probably don't know it's a theme of mine. I don't like to edit. I try to get it right in the first place so I don't have to edit. I hate editing. I really, really do. I don't like sitting in front of a computer all day. That said, if you shoot it right, the edit can be very quick. I probably got all my editing done in about an hour. So what were the challenges of shooting with available light? Um, let me answer a question real quick. That black and white are in camera or processing? Processing. I always shoot raw, uh, full raw, you know, not the lower res version. I've never, I never shoot in the medium res raw, full raw, and then I convert into black and white. Um, and we'll t I'll talk more about that. Let me know if you have a follow-up question. But uh, back to the challenges, I decided to shoot available light, which meant at the image I'm at right now, it looks like I was shooting at ISO 2000. So I was shooting a higher ISO, but I considered this. Uh, do I, am I willing to shoot at a higher ISO, which would mean a little bit more grain or pixelation? However, the benefit would be I would get a more natural look. Of course, that would be after processing because the color balance was all over the place um, and pretty much I settled on a pretty flat look but for me it really this flat kind of look after neutralizing all the different light sources it actually pretty accurately represented what it looked like at the church and so I was pretty happy with how they turned out and the client was very happy by the way so here I'm really forced to shoot wide open I don't shoot wide open because I, you know, it's the end all be all. Sometimes you want more depth, but in this case, I was pretty limited, but that's okay. I mean, I can make it work. So you guys that see the photo I'm on now, it's, uh, I'm not exactly sure if it's a Bible. I assume it's some sort of a holy book. You guys can see where I'm at here, my light source is very warm and tungsteny. <laughs> Um, but it also had a lot of window light and that window light was definitely clashing and back to that photo where I'm at here the overhang it's kind of like above me where I'm shooting from right now there are tungsten lights but the main area didn't have tungsten light and so it, it really didn't work well together I liked the look the tungsten look here but when it came to the people, I kind of avoided it. I didn't want that look. I'm going to make an adjustment because it looks like it's kind of cropping funny. Hopefully that will be better. So a lot of what I'm doing is I'm picking my shots. So if you guys take a look here woman on the left I'm, is my focus and then the gentleman on the right is my focus here so I'm getting one of each and sometimes I've said before I just go down the line um, <laughs> baptisms aren't fun for kids so here you guys are going to see I opted to not try to neutralize the warm light because we have a lot of candlelight and I wanted to capture that and so I'm not playing around I'm not trying to neutralize it um, it depends on where they were standing you know so sometimes I'm gonna go back to, to this image we had really hot lights above them um, pre pretty much like unfiltered lighting so it was very harsh uh, sometimes I will convert to black and white in order to save an image I feel like black and white does hide quite a bit it hide it, it deals with grain or pixelation a bit better Sometimes the lighting is so bad and no matter how much I tinker with it, it doesn't look right and I'll just convert to black and white. But most of the time I'm converting to black and white because I just think the moment works really well as a black and white. Or I have two images that look very similar. Maybe I shot a quick burst because or um, 
I noticed a slight change shot to shot, so I quickly grabbed two in a row. Uh, but when I looked at them in post, I said, you know what, they're really similar. I'll just make one black and white and give some variety to my client. Once in a while, I will have an image that I think works so well as a black and white, but it works so well as a color image, I'll duplicate it, and then I'll make one black and white. Now, <laughs> it's a little sneaky, but one thing I will do is, when you do that, you're opening yourself up to potentially having a client say, hey, I saw you converted that image to black and white. Can you convert this image, that image, that image, that image, <laughs> you know, number 563 and 400, you know, and they start giving you a laundry list of images they'd like in black and white. It's possible they could do that. And one way you can kind of avoid that happening is you just crop the, if you duplicated an image, crop it so it looks like a different image and then they're not going to have those concerns they're not going to really it might not register um i try to be upfront and honest it's just who i am but i understand like i i, I have to have the creative license as a photographer if someone does ask me for something i'm not going to be like oh how dare you i'm an artist remember this is a service you're providing you're being creative for someone else. You are not creating. It is not your baby. And so the client comes first. Uh, but so if someone asked me, I would do it. But typically you're building a relationship with them beforehand. They're hiring you because they trust your vision. And you and because of that, you shouldn't have a problem. I'm warning you guys, not because of a bunch of experience that I've had with clients asking for that kind of thing, but I know it's a possibility. The one time, the one time I did have sort of an issue, it was when uh, it was an older couple. I think I, I photographed like their 50th anniversary and they asked me if I could make, if I can convert all the black and white images back to color. And I said, okay, I did it and I moved on. This is a shot I really like. So I, I went from granddaughters to grandmother. And one thing, if you can't get everyone in focus, it's I think it's important that you get someone in focus in each, like each person that is in the shot, get one of them in focus. So like you'll have a series of shots and I'm trying ideally to, looks like I didn't get it here, but I'm ideally trying to get can you guys see my mouse? Um, I would ideally get her in focus in one shot, her in focus in one shot, and then I would move to the grandmother and get her. So here you guys have, let's see, are they the same image? They are actually different images, and you guys can see if I hit C on my keyboard to compare. You guys will see a um, comparison they're very very similar here's an example of where I say okay I have two really good images and I know one would make a good black and white so I'll convert one to black and white all right before I move on does anyone have a question Question, insight, want to share your work, anything, put it in the comments. All right, keep moving on. So it is a challenge to work the way I'm working, meaning no flash, shooting wide open. You have to be really precise with your focus. And this is something I feel like I've really gotten quite good at not because I'm amazing, but because 10 years of experience and a dedication to my craft, I've gotten really good at focusing on the pupil as much as possible. That said, you will miss at times. And I'm starting to get to the point where I feel like I am hitting some limitations with my camera. Uh, I have the 5D Mark III, I have a 7D Mark II, which is actually better as far as autofocus goes. I mean, that camera, like, I'm still amazed by technology. The fact that I'm live streaming right now <laughs> is amazing to me. But um, I still think the 7D Mark II's autofocus is phenomenal. 
uh, the only complaint would maybe be that I wish it had a larger focusing area, like those focus points were more widely distributed across the screen. But my 5D3, I'm starting to see the limitations. It's kind of interesting because usually something new comes out, you try it out, and then it opens your eye to like how boring your or not good <laughs> your old gear was in comparison. Um, you know, it's kind of like if you drive a Camry for 10 years and then one day you drive like something really fast, you're going to be spoiled by that experience and you're going to realize your Camry was kind of boring. It's kind of like that. So here I'm still shooting now with a lot of the candlelight. So the question I'm facing is, the interesting point I was trying to make is that although I haven't really used the most modern cameras, I'm kind of like feeling like where the initial amazement, um, like awe I had for the 5D Mark III is starting to fade because I went from the 5D Classic to the Mark III and when I did so I found that I was like holy cow how did I even work with the 5D Classic but it made me a really good photographer because limitations really push you to enhance your skill uh, I got really good at flash using flash I had to learn it because I couldn't rely on high ISO and so the 5D Mark III's ISO performance and autofocus capability were incredible but eight what am i at eight years later i'm starting to say you know it could be better even though i don't have a comparison even though i'm not trying different cameras and then comparing them i can tell that i'm hitting a i'm kind of like starting to push it i'm looking at some of my work and being like yeah i wish this or that could have been better i wish there wasn't as much noise in my high ISO shots. I wish I could shoot higher. For me, I have a, my ceiling, what I find passable is about ISO 3200. That's not a technical ceiling. It's what I've felt has been the most I feel comfortable pushing my camera after looking at the results the first few months of having it. But yeah, the autofocus, uh, I'm starting to realize like it, it's not always user error. error. At times, I think the camera has let me down a little bit. That said, the 5D Mark III is an incredibly capable camera. I'd strongly recommend it to someone starting out. It gets the job done. It's about your work, your eye, more than your camera. Um, that said, all things being equal, take the same photographer, give them a superior camera. The work will be better, of course, it might open up what they're able to capture. It might, so it could be a game changer, but it's it, give the better camera to the inferior photographer, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the skilled photographer all the way. So. As always with my work, I'm looking to capture moments. Every image should be about something. You want there to be meaning in it. Uh, I'm not, as I've said, I'm a lazy editor, meaning I try, I don't like to edit, so I don't do a lot of processing to my work. Um, sometimes, well, Sometimes I miss a shot where, like, perhaps this one, I, I, his face is a little, I'm not sure, he's, like, in between expressions. I could have maybe edited this image out. But you guys got to remember, I'm balancing, delivering the photos as soon as possible um, with the quality of the edit. Um, and sometimes I try not to under-edit an image. Like, I try to make sure an image looks its best. But sometimes I'll miss an edit, an image that could have been removed. That's the part I like the least, actually, is the calling of my images. I, I really don't like looking at the bad work, and when you know, I I usually have a very high hit rate, but I try to meticulously um, uh, narrow down the body of work as much as possible. 
And so that's the biggest challenge for me, the biggest amount of work. Uh, the actual edit, meaning correcting for color, contrast, exposure, that sort of thing, is pretty quick. And I will make a video on that, by the way. I'll make a video on it, and that will kind of um, give you guys some more insight on my workflow as far as my edit goes. Okay, let's take a look at comments. Igor, let me move my mic here. Igor says, have you tried the new Sony A6400 and 6600 focusing system? You might like it. I might. <laughs> I don't know. I might. Yeah, sure. I'm not going to switch. Um, I, it's tricky. It's tricky. Because when I'm using my 5D Mark III, I don't like using my 7D Mark II, by the way. I, I'm not a huge fan of using two bodies. I don't like having to walk around with two bodies hanging off my shoulder it's not a huge problem but i like to be really nimble i like to be able to m maneuver quickly i like to feel like i'm a little cat you know sneaking around grabbing my shots going unnoticed and having two big cameras with two big lenses hanging off my shoulders i find that to be a problem uh but also i do notice the quality difference between the images the 7d mark ii is a newer camera than my 5d mark iii but I favor the images that come out of the 5D Mark III. That said, I had an X-T3 for a little while, and I didn't find there to be an issue at all with that being a cropped frames uh, camera. And the, high, the ISO performance was phenomenal. So I, 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 it's like a cognitive dissonance here where I have two different takes on it. Um, my experience with the X-T3, totally good, solid. Um, it wasn't a perfect camera. I had complaints and I do don't think I could have used that camera um, as a replacement to like a 5d mark 3 it just wasn't the workhorse I needed I didn't like how it operated um, but I loved using it like for myself but yeah I loved that camera had no problem with it being a crop frame camera yet when I looked at the 7d mark 2 files versus the 5d mark 3 files the 5d mark 3 files were far superior better ISO um, better look to the images other questions I was hoping I could do a slideshow so I could talk and go through the photos at once um, but now I'm like looking at my laptop to look at questions while I'm using a keyboard to move the images around um, etc so you guys might see a pause on an image for a little while okay more questions what do we have Drunk Saru, some of these photos seem pretty dark on the subjects because of the very light background and dark clothing. With the subjects, would you isolate and post-process the subject and brighten them up or increase the shutter or ISO and be okay with blowing out the background? That's a good question. Um, it is something I had to think about when I did my editing. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I'm looking for the best balance all around. And I don't like to make my images art too artificial looking too. If I do a, a heavy amount of post-processing uh, to compensate for... Okay, so let me back up a little bit. It's tricky. Um, when shooting those shots, I could have shot... I sh could have exposed for the subjects, but then I would have had a blown out background. Yeah, and so I'm usually kind of balancing between the two and then gives me more latitude in post-processing to kind of like tweak one or the other. So if I focused for, if I had a completely blown out background, if it's too blown out, I can't recover it. Um, so that is an issue. So I'm finding a, in between and then I'm lowering my highlights and then I'm raising my shadows. Um, I will be honest for, with you guys, I probably could have edited a little bit more. If this was like, if I want, you you know, give me like a week, the edit might be better. Give me six months, it might be better, you know. Uh, maybe in a, with a year, the edit could be even better, you know. But I'm balancing delivering these in a timely amount of time um, with the quality. That's one thing you guys probably won't hear, like the honest truth about the actual workflow and logistics of delivering images and everything okay let me know if I answered that question N another question 
I'm going to figure out how to say this. Ly, I know you've commented on my channel. Uh, Lyric. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, do you call using Lightroom or do you use something like Photo Mechanic? Uh, I hear a lot of people talk about how Photo Mechanic is faster at calling. I don't know much about it. I just have heard that. But I have a theory as to why. And it's likely because when you upload to Lightroom, it has to generate previews. And if your Lightroom is slow, it's because you didn't generate the previews. So unfortunately, I haven't figured out my streaming software. It, it has a weird problem where it's not showing the tabs on the side of Lightroom where I could show you guys how to do it or the top really either. Let me see. But if you go to the top of the screen, if you didn't do one-to-one -one previews when you did your import, you can go to photo. I'm doing it right now to take a look. Lyric tenor. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, someone just, <laughs> my friend just texted me how to say your name correctly. Lyric tenor. <laughs> I'm like doing too many things at once. Yeah, I, I can see that really clearly now. <laughs> um, go to photo and I think, and we're looking for generate one-to-one -one previews. It was in the library, I forgot. Uh, but anyway, you're looking for gener, yeah, there it is. You go to library, you have all your images selected, you go to previews, then you go to build one-to-one -one previews. And that way, every time you look at an image, you don't have to generate a preview. So if you've done that, it should be just as quick to call as, as Photo Mechanic, theoretically. You know, a lot, a lot of these non-photographers that are YouTubers talking about photography <laughs> talk about how slow their Lightroom is and they, they don't know about a simple thing like generating previews. If you're in a bind, if you need to do something very quickly, what you can do is also not import it through Lightroom. Like let's say you just want to quickly dump the files onto your computer. You can just take all, all of those files, move it into the folder you want, and then in Lightroom you can synchronize the folder that folder is in it will find those folder that folder and then you can catalog it in Lightroom okay lyric tenor let me know if I answered your question I'm not um, I need to acknowledge I need to acknowledge something here is that I I probably wasn't consistent enough in how I compensated for like the tricky lighting Is Photo Mechanic free? Like for me, if it's like a paid software, I would probably not even bother if I'm gonna use Lightroom as well. So I actually, when it came to doing some family portraits, I decided to just keep shooting with available. I tried with flash, I didn't really like it, and then I decided I'd rather have the images be consistent. Um, here is an image that slipped through and I should have deleted. I missed my focus. It happened. But there we have one in focus. I'm not sure how that image got by. 
it's not free i think a couple hundred dollars yeah i don't i don't see the point in even i'll be honest with you guys too like <laughs> i understand tech i get it but i don't like it and so i do this thing where i pretend i don't understand it and then i don't like so i don't try new things very quickly i'll be honest with you guys you know um like I didn't enjoy learning to stream, but I really wanted to be able to do this. It wasn't that complicated. So here we have, we're going to see a few family portraits mixed in. Remember, I, I'll just start it from the beginning for those of you that came a little late. I basically made a, did a selection. Let's unselect the two stars and we'll show everything now and I'll go through them a little bit quicker. Now you guys will see a bit of pretty much everything I delivered. So the okay images, the average images, the really good ones all mixed in. One weakness I have, because it's important to really know to like be in a dispassionate way, meaning not like beating yourself up, don't be so critical of yourself, but in a dispassionate way, address your weaknesses. What are you good at? What are you not good at? Um, I made a video on the six shot types I use at an event, and I'll link it right now because I think it was a good one. But one of my flaws would be that I don't get the wide shots enough as I probably should. Those wide shots that are really not just for stylistic purposes, but for creating being, you know, and having an established an establishing shot. Um, if you ever seen like a low budget movie that never even shows an establishing shot, you feel almost disorienting, disoriented. You don't know where the image the scene is taking place. It can be really disorienting. Um, so I don't think I actually get enough of those types of shots, in my in my opinion. Um, I don't enjoy them. I, I, what I really enjoy is capturing these moments. Authentic moments, interactions, the emotional highs. That's what I do, you know. And we tend to do what we're good at or we get good at what we love. And, you know, that's what happens. That's what I do. <laughs> um I'm going to just quickly grab a link for you guys because I want to share that for you. Um, and meanwhile, does anyone have any questions? Don't be scared and just wait for someone else to ask. This is actually my most popular video. Not, it doesn't have the most views, but I would say like it will eventually. Okay, back to Lightroom. So you guys can see when we have a very flat, even light source, we don't if I zoom into this gentleman's eye, we don't have any specular highlights, which can make eyes look a bit dead. It is a problem. Um, it's always better to have a little sparkle. It adds life to the image, to the subject. So here we have two different images. I'm guessing I actually cropped in on that, but we're looking at JPEGs at the moment, so I couldn't see the before and after. Yeah, basically depending on where they were standing, the light was very different. On the sides of the church, it had a lot of tungsten light. In the middle, it didn't. So we had a very kind of diffused... Um, soft light
So I've, as I've said before, I'm trying to go chronologically with these videos, meaning I'm going to go from most recent to eventually 10 years back sharing my work. But if you guys have anything specific you'd like to see, let me know. And I'd be happy to try to like, if it's like, I don't want to skip ahead too much, but I'll look for it. If I'm happen to be in like, you know, uh, if I'm looking at work from 2018, I'll look through 2018 for that kind of job. Let's see what we have for Lyric Tenor. You ask, I know you chose to go with ambient light for this. Do you usually keep the flash on the camera in case you want to use it? Or do you use a transmitter and hold? No, if I'm not going to use it, I'm not going to put it on the body because it gets really cumbersome. I sometimes I, I know I will be switching back and forth. And what I do is to kind of balance the weight a bit better. I point the flash toward my face. Basically, I push the head down and toward me. And that makes the camera balance a bit better. But I don't like how the camera balances with a flash on it. And so usually if I'm not going to use it, I just take it off. As far as a transmitter goes, I only do that if I don't have walls I can bounce my light off of. Uh, I do that when I know that, yeah, pretty much if I, I have no option of bouncing and I don't want that on-camera diffusion, like diffuser cap look, I don't like it. I like direction to my light, which I achieve from bouncing light or from having the camera off, sorry, the flash off camera. So that is pretty cumbersome, but... Theoretically, if you had like a belt, a, pou a pouch or something, you could store the flash in that and then put a transmitter on the camera, which won't really add much weight. Uh, as far as a transmitter goes, what I realized is I have the old STE2, which was Canon's proprietary trigger system before you really had third party options where it was like 250 bucks and all it did is fire a flash, which now cameras can do using the camera flash. But, you know, if your camera didn't have a flash and you wanted to trigger an off-camera flash with TTL, you had to buy this $250 uh, peripheral. What I realized is it works with my 430EX. I think it's an EX2 maybe. But it doesn't work with my newer um, 600EX RT2, whatever it's called. Um... So tonight, I'm doing a Zoom call with my students. We ended classes, but just as a courtesy, I, I said, hey, guys, I'll keep them going during the whole shutdown. Um, so we're continuing to do my classes that I teach at Barnstall. Is anyone in Los Angeles, by the way? Anyone local? And if not, where are you? So the assignment I gave them, and I definitely would encourage anyone to do this. <laughs> I said I would do it too, and I haven't done it yet. So today I have to go shooting. I said I'm going to do your assignment with you guys, you know, to I want to participate. I probably won't share my work, though. That would be a little weird. But um, the, the assignment was to reflect on... COVID-19, how it's affecting your life um, or others. And so there's so many ways you guys can do that, you know. Oh, you're local. Long Beach is pretty close, although not with traffic. Probably right now I could get to Long Beach in like 35 minutes. Normally it might be like up to an hour and a half, two hours actually. But um, how can you reflect on this? You could document your own life in isolation. You can go out photograph empty stores I think just in the middle of the day photographing into closed stores could be interesting you could do portraits of people out and about from far away uh, you could do portraits of people wearing their masks you know 
there's an opportunity to be creative here. And so I said I was going to participate in my student's assignment, but I've been stressed out myself uh, and not taking my own advice because I have to worry about money right now because I'm not working. It's really hard to be creative when you have, you know, more more essential needs that need to be taken care of. That is a challenge. Texas. Never been to Texas. I'd like to go. All right, I think we have a question. Igor, you have mentioned before wide shots and that you don't take them enough. I am not local. Serbia, okay. I've never been there either. I say that like as if I've been like to a lot of places. But I actually did go to like eight countries or something in Europe. Six countries maybe. Um, but I didn't go to Serbia. And another thing about like wide angle and shooting with available light and all that, I'm making the best decision, you know, I can. I'm taking in all the variables and deciding what would work best. But I also try things for my own sake so long as I think it will work, result in quality images. You know, I don't want to like, I don't want to say I'm only going to shoot with a fisheye lens and see if I can make that work or I'm only going to shoot with the wide angle. Like, that wouldn't be fair to my client, but I do try things. And maybe for like an hour, if it's a long event, I'll break out a lens I don't use as often. Or I'll try to use a lens in a different way. Um, you got to have fun. You have to challenge yourself. Try things. Like, it's you have to play. So one way you could play would be shooting really wide, but trying to get close. Something most people don't want to do. But when you're able to pull those off without going, going noticed, it's really rewarding. So trying new things, giving yourself new challenges. I've done this for a very long time. And if I do this, the exact same thing every time, I'll enjoy it, but it could get a little bit boring. And basically, I'm trying to balance a couple of things, really. Um, one, actually, you know, I, I relate a lot of what I do to jujitsu, which is my other big thing, like my big passion. I've done that for 14 years. And my objective for both is actually the exact same. My objective for photography and for when I'm training is to lose myself in the moment and to shut off my mind. The prefrontal cortex, the part that's like very conscious of myself. I want to get into what... In the West, we call a flow state, where you're no longer thinking consciously. You're just processing and responding at an incredibly fast rate because you don't have that buffer of your ego. Your ego serves as a buffer from like perception to action. So I'm trying to turn that off. But at jujitsu, if I'm just training, no matter what, when I train and I get to that state, I end, it's spiritual and I'm happy. I'm in the zone. But that said what helps me get there is I have to be creative. If I train with partners that are just too easy and there's uh, my ego gets nothing out of beating them, right? Um, and if it it's boring, then I don't feel creative. And so I have to challenge myself. In jiu-jitsu, if I'm training with like white belts, blue belts, whatever, that might not mean anything to you guys, I basically will do things like not use my hands or not use my arms. Um, and then I get excited. It's interesting again. It's exciting. It's a challenge. But if I just try to, if I'm just going to beat them and use like everything I've got, what am I getting out of that? Like that isn't fun. 
you know? And so with this, I have to have fun too. If I want to really get in the zone, I have to challenge myself. If I'm doing the same thing over and over, yeah, I out of habit, like I can do this without, you know, trying, you know, it's very, it's, uh, it's, it's very, um, it's all subconscious. It can be, but I challenge myself to make it more interesting and then I get creative. I enjoy it. I don't feel burnt out. You know, there are periods where I felt a little bit more burnt out than others. And then I find a new way to shoot that reinvigorates my spirit and I get excited again. I hope that made sense to you guys. They say the ingredient for hitting a flow state is when things are just challenging enough where you have the skill and it's just challenging enough for you to have to push yourself to rise to the occasion. But if something's too easy, you get bored and you won't enter a flow state. So some of the most rewarding jobs I've ever had were, was when I, I was hired by like, I remember the first time I got hired by a really big company, like really big company. Um, like, a, I would say the first one, I think I shot for Nike after. I shot for Adobe. And, I mean, they, they're, <laughs> I'm the photographer chosen to photograph a conference, their Adobe Max, for creatives and photographers. And it was an honor. And so there was some pressure, but I believed in myself and my ability, and I felt just on fire because of it, you know? It was a challenge, it was an honor, uh, but I felt up to the task, but I pushed myself, and so everything kind of, I had all the right ingredients. And I remember, it was hard work, of course, you have, those are long days when you shoot a conference, but I was going home feeling just incredible, you know? It was very rewarding. But if you go to a job and it just feels like, and you don't enter that flow state, for me, um, maybe this sounds like, you know, nonsense to some of you guys, but if I don't enter a flow state, if I don't feel like I'm really on fire, even if the work is pretty good, I just don't feel good. It's kind of like going to the gym too. You don't want, uh, my focus is the process, not the outcome, right? Because if you focus on the outcome, sometimes you're going to have a job where lighting's bad, uh, no one's smiling, you don't have the right ingredients, but you're on fire because you're able to get yourself to a point where you're just doing an incredible job, but maybe the work for won't be as good as the work of a job where everything was easy, but you didn't really rise to the occasion. Um, that one will, the latter example, would be less rewarding for me. Igor says, of course, it makes sense. Uh, I don't know, though. I'm not sure. I know it makes sense to me. But it might be a foreign idea to some, what I'm talking about.
Michael, uh, <laughs> Michael, your text popped up and disappeared. I'm guessing it's not like uh, what you actually want to ask. So go ahead and like ask me, but I'm going to answer anyway. Um, I saw a question about if I prefer wide angle. Um, basically, I don't. I prefer capturing authentic moments and interactions, and I have a tendency to get really close up with a telephoto to get it. Not from really far away. I don't feel like I need a 70 to 200 at 200. Um, but, you know, like an 85, maybe I'm using a 24 to 70, and I'm using it at its longer focal length, that kind of thing. Um, I like my 135 millimeter. Uh, my priority is capturing the moments, really, and I. But I maybe I simply fought, uh, fall. I have let me hang on. Maybe I've simply fallen into the habit of shooting with telephoto telephoto focal lengths. That doesn't mean I prefer it. I mean, ideally, you're mixing it up. There's no percentage. It's not like you should have 20% wide. Like here we have a wide shot. And I think this is a really good image to have. You have mom, dad, daughter, godfather. I, I'm not familiar enough. I think it's Greek Orthodox. It's a Greek Orthodox church. Um, so I'm not familiar with who these two are. One I assume is a priest, but then there's another thing. And maybe someone knows. I don't know, though. Um it's a good opportunity for me to talk about do you is it helpful for example to be jewish if you're going to photograph a bar mitzvah um <laughs> i mean maybe for your first go around um maybe you know being familiar with the traditions might help you predict things but if you understand people and you develop a sense for things where you know when something's going to happen you know you know like I know I've gotten heat for this, but I don't need a schedule of events typically. I kind of can just feel when something's about to happen. You start to intu intuitively get it, like big conferences to religious ceremonies. You start to get a sense for where you need to be and when you need to be there. But that said, of course, a schedule of events is helpful. Um, I have a different type of personality than others. You know, everyone has their own personality. Some people are going to want to know every detail and then some people like me don't want to know every detail they just want to be present um of course if you can somehow do both i mean that could be beneficial but we all have different personalities we're gonna have a different approach to photography we're gonna have a different way of managing our anxieties about the high pressure of a job for me i manage anxiety by not thinking about the details and just being present other people will manage their anxiety about a job by knowing every detail so there's no unknown. Uh, let's take a look at questions. Um, what I was saying is that I, I, Michael, what I was saying is that I don't think I shoot wide enough. These images we're at right now, I mean, Unfortunately, Lightroom isn't showing you guys the tabs. I can't get it to show with the streaming software, but I can see it. And I can tell you the image I'm on right now is at ISO 1600 at 24 millimeters. So I am shooting at the widest focal length of my 24 to 70. So yeah, I am shooting wide at the moment. And then in this shot, I'm at the far end of my focal length. I'm at 70 millimeters. So in my videos where I talk about gear for events, one thing I recommend is getting a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200 and calling it a day <laughs> um, as a starting point. But you guys also know if you watch my videos, I shoot with the 85 millimeter at events. I like my 135 millimeter. A 17 to 40 is nice for those wide establishing shots but you don't need it. Typically, you are going to be able to back up enough with the 24 millimeter focal length, um, but there will be times where you would prefer to have something like a 17 millimeter focal length. Okay, um, what did you use for lighting? Okay, I'm glad I went through this again. Um, for lighting, I when I got there, I decided to go with 
available light and so I didn't use my flash. I used it at the very end once and then decided it wasn't worth it because it didn't really mix in with the rest of the images. And so I had challenges in shooting available. It required more post-processing. At times you can see I'm correcting for people's skin tones, but then we have a very different light source behind them, um, which comes out kind of greenish. So there must have been some sort of fluorescent is my suspicion. I'm going to go through these a little quicker. Um, Alex, what did do you wear for different event types? Do you use unofficial? Do you use an un, unofficial uniform or do you make a decision on each case? Um, yeah, I probably have go to's um, daytime events, like if it's a political event. But during the day, it depends. I'm going to wear like maybe an untucked collared shirt with slacks but when I photographed like Nancy Pelosi for example I'm like okay it's Nancy Pelosi I'm gonna wear a suit and I don't regret that um, I did not I did not overdress for that one um, I always prefer to overdress rather than underdress but my go-to's if it's like a children's birthday party let's start with like the least formal I'll wear a nice like black t-shirt, like a nice one, not just some like random Hanes black t-shirt. You know, I bought a, I buy, I don't like shopping. <laughs> so like every once or twice a year, I get these like Banana Republic 50% off discount codes and I'll buy like $700 worth of clothes and I'll get it for like 350. I don't spend quite that much, but you know, I do that once in a while. And so I have like a lot of really nice black t-shirts. I'll wear those with slacks. Um, I don't typically wear jeans though. If it's like I said, a daytime political event, maybe I wear slacks with a collared shirt or I'll wear a suit. I, I don't know. It, it just, there's nothing wrong with asking. I rarely ask and I have rarely gotten it wrong where I show up and I'm like, ooh, I'm over or underdressed. Sometimes, yeah, I'm overdressed actually, but that's fine. You don't, it's okay to be overdressed. You just don't want to be underdressed. And I will tell you, people take, uh, take you more seriously depending on how you're dressed. Your impression does matter. It, it does. I got an email. Uh, I won't. Um, from one of you guys t asking about that because they felt like they were called out at a job and actually got yelled at for photographing people. And we tried to troubleshoot why that was. And I do think it may have had to do with how he was dressed a little bit because he wasn't actually the official photographer at the event. And perhaps it showed and people wanted to know why this guy was photographing them. If you were dressed up, Perhaps they would assume you were the official photographer and they, you know, maybe you wouldn't get heat. Uh, you can avoid the whole thing by just going unnoticed and that should be your objective ideally. But remember, balance that with knowing you have a job to do if you are paid. You have a job to do. You're there for a reason. Your job is important. Your client values photography. It's okay to be seen photographing people. It's okay to briefly interrupt someone's view of an event if you need to get a shot just don't linger all right uh, i got a lot of questions let's take a look um I'll actually let me just finish up i go on tangents um as far as how i dress if it's like a wedding you guys know i don't i've moved away from weddings but i wear a really nice suit um women you know wear the equivalent but don't don't look good but don't make it, uh, how, how do I put it? Don't look, you don't want a peacock, right? <laughs> like I wear a very nice, or I, I have a couple or a few very nice fitted suits. I, I like suits. I dress like I'm homeless when I'm in my neighborhood and then I dress up in suits when I work. I have no middle ground. <laughs> I, I have this weird thing where I really do like suits. And I think it's because I don't have to wear them <laughs> on a daily basis, you know? If I had a 
office job and they were demanding I dress up, I would resent it, right? It's making me conform. But for me, I'm choosing to put on a suit for the most part and I enjoy it. Uh, so people have commented on my suit, how nice it looks, but I'm not wearing jewelry. Like I'm not wearing a big neck chain. I'm not wearing a fancy watch or I don't know. What is it? Chanel or Gucci belts. I see a lot of, I don't even know what they are. They're like two C's facing away from each other, whatever that is. You know, I don't do that. Um, and if you're a woman, you don't want to wear like a brightly fl colored floral dress. You know, you want it to fit. You want it to look good, high quality, look professional, but don't stand out, um, you know, in a negative way. Okay. Let me get back to questions. Um, Alex, I think I answered your question. If I didn't, hit me up with a follow-up question. Igor says, what type of photography have you tried and worked for money? And what type of photography do you re did I not like? Um, okay. So check out my catalog of videos because I think I've talked about sort of my journey in photography, how I ended up here. I'll, I'll try to do the very quick version. I started out shooting weddings because I knew I could get into it quite easily. I started in 2008. I just moved back to Los Angeles and I really put my foot down. I wandered around. <laughs> You know, from location, like figuratively and literally, you know, I lived in Portland. I lived in Peru. Uh, I was like, what am I doing with my life after college? I never thought I could make a living off of something I loved, like photography. Back then, I did get a digital camera, but it wasn't quite the same. Uh, I, I still loved film. I learned on film. It's all I shot in college. And you couldn't just continue shooting because you needed a dark room. I mean, I suppose I could have done like the scanning thing. I'm not even sure. Back then, to the best of my knowledge, there was no real option for me. Um, and so I kind of like wasn't doing what I loved for a few years. So, you know, I did it here and there, but I wasn't doing what I loved. I mean, imagine the photography I could have shot in Peru or when I went to Israel or in Portland, you know, like I tried in Portland with my little point and shoot, but it was very unsatisfying. So when I moved back in 2008, there was like this epiphany, epiphany moment where I said, I'm done doing this. I'm going to pursue what I'm, I'm passionate about. Uh, I actually thought maybe it would be film, like filmmaking. And then I was having a strange uh, conversation with a stranger and I, they looked over, I was sitting next to them at this like uh, conference and they saw my pros and cons list of the two and she started talking to me about it and she just bluntly said, dude, you obviously want to be a photographer. And when a stranger told me that, I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> like it clicked. And so I, I said, okay, I'm doing this. And I remember I made an Excel sheet of every wedding photographer in LA, which was a lot easier to do at the time. It, it wasn't so oversaturated. We're really coming into the age at this point of social media. And so it wasn't as, uh, people were starting to figure out that you could market yourself that way. But for the most part, you had large studios still that dominated the market. Called every photographer on my Excel sheet, made sure I had notes, made sure who to ask for, etc. Um, I systemized it, um, not typically that organized, but I was, called them all. No one called, uh, very few called back, called me back. The ones that did said, sorry, I just don't have room for an assistant. I wasn't even trying to second shoot. I, I was humble. I, I knew, I knew photography because it's all I cared about in college. I was a history major that basically lived in the dark room. And, but I knew I didn't know the trade. And I was humble, and I said I want to assist. I didn't even care if I got paid. Um, then, but they all said, no, we really don't have room. And then one guy's like, tried David Michael photography. <laughs> and they're big. And I called them and had to leave a voicemail. I got a call back almost immediately, and I was like, whoa. Like, I didn't expect it. You know, I was getting so disappointed. And it's like, yeah, come in. We'd love to talk to you. I dressed up. I wore a suit without a jacket. I didn't wear the jacket. Um, I, what I had done prior to that is I shot a wedding. 
basically for free. I, I charged $180 or something, enough to cover rentals. I shot that wedding. I showed them the results. They were impressed. Um, they were technically good. Um, I don't think I was where I'm at now as far as like recognizing the important moments. But they're like, yeah, we have like uh, like 200 people actually asking about working with us. But you seem good. We'll give you a shot. And that's how it happened. And I started. And by the way, <laughs> it wasn't assisting. They were like, yeah, we're going to have you as a second shooter. Just like that. I was like, wow. And I remember driving home screaming at, at the top of my lungs because it was the first big break I had. Um, I had a lot of bad luck when I moved here. You know, I didn't have a car to drive and. Then my bicycle got stolen and nothing good was happening. <laughs> and so that's how I got into wedding photography. And I did that for years. And then I started doing like smaller events. And here and there, you know, I, I, they had me pretty busy. I'd work sometimes three days a week shooting weddings. And then I started doing my own weddings. I started doing my own smaller events. And it kind of just kept going from there. Um, and unfortunately, I never stopped and said, wait, what do I really want to be shooting? Unlike a lot of photographers that romanticize photography, professional work, they all want to be like a fashion photographer. I never had that desire. I never wanted to be one. It's not my thing. Like, like I don't really follow fashion. I get it, though. I think it is kind of beautiful. When you go, I go to a really good exhibit of fashion photography and see some of the greater fashion photographers like Helmut Newton, that kind of thing, at Annenberg Space for Photography, they had a good show. You know, I appreciate it. Uh, I never cross interests. I photographed a few jujitsu tournaments, but they just weren't really, I had no desire to kind of cross those interests. I did a project about jujitsu because I wanted to do something no one had done. But as far as like photographing tournaments, even though, and also there's like no money. Um, I shot for Adidas once and they tried to stiff me. I almost had to sue them. It was not a good experience. But yeah, so what have I tried? Um, pretty much I've done, started with weddings, did smaller events and weddings, stopped doing weddings, but I've, um, I've done acting headshots here and there for people I know, and I've done uh, professional photos. So sometimes, uh, maybe you're a psychologist and you need headshots. I'll do those, but also people hire me to do more creative portraits that don't want your typical very boring professional headshot they see like what i've done for my own self like my photo series i've done with my dog and they want something like that so i've done that all right more questions that was a lot of talking i will need water so alex agrees but i have no idea what you're agreeing with because you know there's a delay and i was talking and not looking at the comments <laughs> Um, back up a little more. Igor asks if I prefer a backpack or shoulder bag for events. I'm a, I'm a mule. I'm like a pack mule. I don't like rolling things. I like to carry stuff. I like, to, I'm like a beast of burden. You know, uh, when I travel, I like a backpack. I have a backpacking backpack. I don't know what you call that. Um, I carry my gear in a shoulder bag. That's literally like almost 40 years old. The guy I shot with starting out eventually bought himself a new one after 30 years of use. He bought himself the exact same bag and uh, he gave me his old one and I still use it. Um, yeah, so I like to I, I like to carry things, but um, I, as I get older, it's not that it's getting much harder, but I'm starting to be like, why am I burdening myself? Like, why don't I make this easy? And I, I'm con I've considered a rolling bag. I just feel like I can maneuver things when I can just pick up a bag and go. I like I feel like I can maneuver around better than having to roll something. Okay, so I answered that. Alex, to be honest, I think the clothes and attitude are more important than the kit. Today's cameras and lenses are great. Uh, the skill of the photographer is 90 to 95%, in my opinion. As long as you're not working with really outdated gear, um, you're okay. And... Older gear pushes you to be a better photographer, in my opinion. Okay. Other questions? So Michael says, don't overdress. Um, 
Tell us why. Uh, I, I, I would rather overdress and underdress. Ideally, you're appropriately dressing, but uh, I would rather overdress. And worst case, if you wear a suit, you take off your jacket, take off your tie. You should be okay, like if everyone's pretty casual. Alex, I had an event with everyone in bow ties, and it was the event theme. I got a comment from one of the attendees. Why was I wearing a tie and not a bow tie? Because I am working, not enjoying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't really dress to the theme if there's a theme myself. Uh, Alex, you said you did. I, I don't remember what you're responding to. I was horrified doing a wedding. The pressure pressures are daunting yeah um a wedding is yeah <laughs> you'll get over it you know that your first few weddings or maybe for like a year are gonna be tough you know you get confident as a photographer even if your skill level doesn't change you'll get more confident the more you do the job because you're going to be familiar with the work also if you get the older you are like i i as a 20 something year old i felt like oh, i wasn't taking as i wasn't being taken as serious and i think i w probably wasn't but mostly it probably was in my head and as a an older photographer not i'm not old but you know now i'm in my 30s uh, i feel like i'm a really good professional age i'm young but i'm mature i'm not a kid i'm not old it's a good age um Let's see what else we have. I hope that... Alex, I hope that helps what I said about weddings. I don't know. I wish I could just take away your anxiety over it. It does get easier. Michael, I see some black and white photos. I am starting to really enjoy black and white. Do you get many requests for black and white? I don't get any. Uh, I just do them. I, I, you know, I take artistic license. I don't do black and white for corporate events, by the way. If it's a private event, I do. If it's something I think they might frame, that kind of thing. Alex, do you check the light for white balance at a venue at the beginning, or do you calculate when editing? Well, I'm always trying to get it right in camera. I'm only, you know, fixing and editing what I couldn't get right in camera. Alex, approached and called in who dares wins. water go for a beer <laughs> okay uh you don't want to overdress and look better than groom <laughs> okay um eh, you probably won't i <laughs> hope you won't uh but again there's nothing wrong with wearing a nice fitted suit if you're a man you know wear a nice fitted suit don't worry about overdressing like looking better than the groom uh just don't wear like you know don't don't like peacock don't wear stuff that's flashy Alex says, oh, I'm older, but weddings are decided by women. Don't tell my wife I said that. Okay. You know, when it comes to age, I'm going to say this. Photography is actually, I'm not going to pretend I'm, you know, doing like hard manual labor, like I'm roofing or anything. But it, I do feel like I couldn't do the job I do now when I'm much older. Uh, I do have a very physical approach to photography. I'm squatting, I'm bending over, I'm going into weird positions to get the shot. I'm very... I'm making sure I'm staying very nimble so I can like navigate through crowds, that kind of thing. I don't know if I'll be able to do that when I'm much older. And as a photographer, I don't have, I have to count on myself for retirement. So if you're just thinking about this, start thinking ahead of time, um, setting aside money for retirement, but also having a way to maybe make income 
when you're a bit older. Uh, for me, like I, I don't do YouTube for income right now, obviously. <laughs> I think it's obvious, but I think maybe when I'm 60, having some sort of thing where like I can kind of pass the torch and help people rather than relying entirely on shooting would be a good thing for me. It's something I'm thinking about now, I think ahead of time. Uh, Alex says he checks venues before. Um, okay, so here's another thing. I'll, I've, it's the kind of thing you get heat for from these armchair fucking critics. Sorry about the language. <laughs> um, but yeah, you get like I've said this before. Once in a while, a photography blog will like post my video or something, and then you'll have someone comment about how. You never do that. You never, ever. That is not a, like these rigid people. I, I, I think you guys can probably tell I don't, I'm not very rigid. And they tell me something like, you know, they just have these really strong opinions because they do something a certain way. They think everyone must do it that way. And I am going to tell you guys, I do not show up to a venue two hours early to scope it out for light. Because A, the lighting will change, and B, if you understand the light, it doesn't take more than a second to look at a venue, an environment, calculate the best way to, to photograph it. It's not complicated stuff. Once you understand lighting and such, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. You have direction of lighting, quality of light, and the intensity of light. It's simple calculations, um, and then that's going to get reinforced by years of experience where you know the best way to shoot a specific environment and once in a while something might throw you off a little bit sure but for the most part no i don't need to go in two hours before i've said i think i said in my last live stream i always show up to a job early i look at google maps and then i double the amount of time it would take so if google maps says 30 minutes to venue i leave an hour before the venue I don't care if I'm if I'm driving to San Diego and it says three hours. Okay, maybe I won't do six hours, but I'm probably going to do at least four to five hours early in order to just absolutely, absolutely ensure I'm there in time. You basically want to leave early enough in case, like, you get T-boned on the way th there that you'll have time to get your car towed and you can take an Uber to the job, you know? So I do that for that reason but i'm not going like significantly ahead of time just to look at lighting and everything you know <clears throat> how many events do you photograph per week? Uh, so i'm asked i'm asked how many events i photograph per week if i'm really busy like the probably the most i've ever done was like five you're pretty much limited to shooting like thursday through saturday maybe sunday actually you know when I get a job during the week, I get really excited um, when I'm booked like on a Wednesday because that means I still have my Friday, Saturday, Sunday to book events, you know. Uh, when I'm pretty busy, I, I'll average two to three. Sometimes I'm only getting one. Alex, I'm 52. And I still do that in corporate events and conferences, and I am a heavy smoker with 16 hours on my feet. It works. Yeah, if it works, it works, you know? To each their own. Like I said, I'm not gonna... How I do things doesn't have to be how you do things. I'm sharing my experience, but I'm not setting out like, this is how you do an event, right? That's uh, not correct. There are some t technical correct things you can do, sure, but there is no correct way to shoot an event, like an end-all, be-all, like my way or the highway kind of thing. If someone tells you that they're very arrogant or very limited in their scope of thinking, you know, they're very close-minded. Oh, I got a bunch of questions. Oh, okay. My pre-visit was not related to light so much as preparing for opportunities, balconies, di uh, directors, pulpits, mirrors, hallways. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with getting there early. Um, 
but I don't I don't need like an hour you know I need a few minutes I stroll around the venue um, I find that coordinators and that type tend to have a certain type of personality that's why they got into being an, an event coordinator and they like to really manage everything and have it all organized and I don't show up and like tell them uh, hey you know what I'm good <laughs> you know I I I listen to them. I let them show me around. Um, but, and then another question I'll get asked is, where is the best spot for this or that? And I'll often say, you know, I defer to the logistics of your event because I can make anything work. Alex says he agrees. How one does it is personal, uh, personal, and I think that in some ways our personality will be reflected in the way we shoot. Not always, you know, I, I like to get these kind of candid moments, but I actually don't have a problem interacting with people. I just prefer to get these candid moments, but... You know, if you're an introvert, you might not want to approach people. Although, not let's not say introvert, but maybe, uh, I mean, introverts can be very friendly too. So, what level of briefing do you get from a client? Does it differ from corporate as opposed to private? Yeah, uh, private usually depends on the private event. If it's like a kid's birthday party, they're usually not briefing me on everything or at all. Uh, corporate events, it depends. Again, yeah, it just depends. Uh, most cases, they're not going to tell you to show up and not tell you like a schedule of events. Most cases, they'll give you a schedule. All right, I'm going to keep scrolling. When I hit the bottom, I'm going to wrap it up. So if you guys have questions for me, please ask. Um, I always plan on doing these live streams for about an hour, but I end up doing... So far, I've done a lot longer each time. Um, I've got to walk my dog. Alex asks if I have backup cameras and lenses have you had kit problems, SD cards? Yeah, um, I've said before, that's another thing. People will argue on forums and whatnot from their high horse how you must have a backup camera. They're not wrong. But if you're just starting out and you barely can afford, you know, a five-year-old used camera, I'm, I'm not going to tell you don't shoot events. You can't do it because you don't have a backup camera. That said... You should have a backup camera. Uh, I have two cameras, not because I like to double use two bodies. Sometimes I do. But for, for the most part, I have two cameras in case the my primary camera fails on me. Uh, I always shoot two memory cards. The only time I've ever, like, not put one in, I mean, it, it's happened, is maybe if I'm doing, like, something that can be reshot, which I shoot less of now. So, for example, like a portrait session. If it's a portrait session, it can't be. It can be reshot, but you don't want to have to reshoot it. You don't want to tell your client, "Hey, we got to reshoot your <laughs> portraits." Um, so even then, you should shoot with two two memory cards. Um, so I always do. Um, but I'm saying what I'm saying is that if I made an exception, it would be for that. As far as SD card failures, I had one in my entire life. It was when I f bought my first. Well, I had like a Rebel for a little while, but my first like camera I bought when I started shooting professionally was a Canon 40D, and it wasn't for a job. It was actually for an important shoot I did for, um, I was teaching and we were submitting these photos for a grant or something, and I think I pulled the card out while it was writing somehow, and that's not something I normally would make. I don't make that mistake, but I think that's what happened. But I was able to use software and I could recover it. So I have not had, that was a one time. Um, I don't really have memory card failures. 
Other kit problems. No. One of the first jobs I ever shot, my 40D also like just like froze up on me. And I was second shooting and he had a backup camera he was going to give me. And then I don't remember if I tried it or if he told me I should try it. I just pulled the battery. Pulling the battery solves most glitches. If your camera freezes up or isn't turning on, just turn it off. Pull the battery, put it back in. How much post-processing do you perform? Are the photos you're showing what you gave? Yes, I gave all of these to my client. I don't perform a lot of post-processing. I'm balancing my post-processing with um, delivering the images in a timely manner. Um, the longer you edit, yeah, technically they, might, they will be better, but I don't have time. It is a business, for so I don't have time for me or the desire to edit for like a month. And, you know, uh, I go through them. I have a system I use for editing as far as like the way I go about it. Most of my editing is culling, getting rid of the non-keepers. Um, let's see what else we have. Igor, we owe you a, at least a dinner and a beer for your advice. Thanks for sharing your experience and knowledge with us. Well, thank you for your for that. I appreciate that. All right, we're three quarters down. If you have another question, let me know. One second, Sam. I will get you my Patreon link. And as I've said, I am a working photographer. I think it's really important you guys know who you are listening to. Um, you don't have to be a working photographer to have a photography channel. Um, I'm not suggesting that. But I think it is important to know the perspective of who you're listening to. And so I am very transparent. I share my work. There are photographers on YouTube that actually don't even have portfolios, which is very strange. Um, Alex, I use a set of prepared Lightroom presets for edit different to everyone else how do you work or will you do that on um yeah I'll, I'll i'll share how i work on another video um i'm really looking for feedback from you guys i'm always trying to basically fill a need like whatever you guys need so i'm open to trying different things uh, i will do a live stream where i talk about how i edit maybe i'll actually do a live edit when i once i book a job you know things are shut down right now but I'll show you guys while I edit, how I edit. Um, so I'm happy to talk about that. Also, I want to do a live, go live and talk about creativity, how we can kind of cultivate it, can it be cultivated, etc. I want to try different things. I'm going to be doing this every day. Um, I have a lot of work to share, and so I'm not going to be short of work to share if I don't have like a big idea on what to share, you know what I mean? This was one of my favorite images, real quick. Hang on, I lost it. Wow, I'm using two screens. One has the, the delay and one one doesn't. That's uh, okay. Oh, actually, I think I started. Um, here's an example of where I have an image that's a little bit soft, 
due to the high ISO. She was kind of swinging, but I was proud of the shot I was able to get considering the variables, you know. Um, but I, you can't be a stickler, you know. Photography, the soul of an image isn't the technical chops. It's not how technically perfect it is. It's about what you're capturing, you know. And I loved the moment I captured, and so I really liked the image. Faults aside. Here's just a few of my favorite images from the job. <laughs> yeah, no, my, my dog, he uh, comes and sits on my foot when he wants to go out. So I got to take him out. All right, I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate all of you. If you uh, want to help me get the word out, because I don't make the kind of content that is very searchable, I'm not making like top five camera reviews, etc. Please share this content with someone you think would really enjoy it. Maybe someone you know that's learning photography or an aspiring professional photographer or another professional photographer that just wants to like be able to have a community. Um, I would ideally love, I think that especially event photography, Event photographers, we need a community, especially right now when we're not able to work. Um, Alex and Michael have a quick thought. I would have thought you would have dropped more of her. I'm not. Uh, and let's see, Alex. No technical, no technical ignores the character of the moment and the expression of or feeling that it portrays. Yep. And thanks a lot. Okay, yeah. Um, Again, thank you guys. I'll see you guys tomorrow with another live stream. You guys have a good one.